Normal faults come in different shapes and sizes. In uh, this presentation, we'll look at a particular shape of normal faults, termed listric. We'll look at the deformation in the hanging wall to these types of normal faults and the creation of features called rollover anticlines. We'll introduce a technique for constructing cross sections through these types of structures, which predicts the relationship between the fault in the hanging wall and the geometry of the fault. We'll strike a note of caution when it comes to interpreting listric faults on seismic reflection data. And we'll have a brief look at a complexity that arises when anticlines in the hanging wall become faulted. So the term listric implies that the fault is spoon shaped. In other words, that it is concave upwards. The fault reduces in dip, the deeper it goes. Now, if we keep the foot wall fixed, a consequence of the displacement on this shaped fault is that the hanging wall deforms and it creates a structure termed a rollover anticline, so called because the beds roll down and over onto the fault plane. And there's a predictable relationship between the shape of this anticline and the shape of the fault. This was explored by the Chevron Oil Company and they give their name to a construction technique, which we can introduce here. And the ambition is to predict the fault geometry from the shape of the rollover anticline. So here we have a line drawing in cross section of a bed in black and a fault in red. And let's imagine that we're trying to interpret some seismic data that is rather poorly imaged at depth. So here's what we do. First thing to do is to construct the regional, in other words, the elevation and orientation of our stratigraphic marker horizon on a long wavelength away from the fault. And we also want to match the terminations of this marker horizon against the fault plane shown by those yellow semicircles. Now let's identify the heave. The heave is the horizontal component of displacement, and what we do is divide the cross-section up into a series of strips defined by the heave. And we divide it up as vertical strips along the regional, as you can see here. Now, the displacement taken by the hanging wall block relative to the football along the fault plane is shown by that purple arrow. So that purple arrow tracks the displacement of a point on the bed. And we could do the same at various places along the section within each of our heave strips. So these arrows track the displacement taken by points along our bed in the hanging wall from its position on the regional down to where we find it today. And these trajectories parallel the displacement of rocks along the fault plane. So we can project these down like this, joining each to the last, starting on the left-hand side and projecting one onto the other to define an arcuate shape. And this tracks the fault trajectory. So here we have a prediction on the basis of the fold, the shape of the rollover anticline, that forecasts the shape of the fault. We could work this backwards because if we knew the shape of the fault, we could also work out by reversing the method, the shape of the rollover anticline. This means we can add other beds into our cross section. This is sometimes termed the vertical shear model because the displacement trajectories are contained within these vertical strips of constant heave. There are derivations that are more complicated that have inclined shear trajectories. So this is just an introduction to the array of different approaches under the Chevron construction method. So it's commonly used for seismic interpretation. Now let's look at a seismic section here just to show the sorts of situations we might apply these sorts of approaches. The section is in seismic two-way time. There's a vertical scale there of one second and a horizontal scale of five kilometers. And you can pick a fault something like that coming down, reducing in dip. So it goes down into that rather disorganized pile of reflectivity at depth, which almost certainly represents salt. You'll notice that the hanging wall to this normal fault has a growth fan picked out by the change in dip upwards of the stratal reflectors. So an example of a listric normal fault. Now we need to strike a note of caution. 
with seismic interpretation. If, as in the last image, the seismic data are displayed not in depth but in two-way time. Generally in the Earth, and particularly in sedimentary successions, seismic velocity generally increases with depth as the rocks become increasingly compacted and this can generate apparent listricity in the trajectory taken by faults. So in this hypothetical example, we have a layered seismic velocity structure with the shallow levels having a lower seismic velocity than the deeper levels. A fairly typical arrangement. And as you go down in this display, the trajectory taken by the fault apparently decreases in depth, giving an apparent listricity. But to see what this fault actually looks like, we need to convert the display from being in two-way time to being in depth. If we do that, we'll reveal that the fault is in reality a planar structure here. So beware simply inferring the shapes of faults or actually any other feature on seismic data when you're dealing with a display in two-way time. It's always worth trying to convert the section to depth. So let's go back to this outcrop that formed the background image to the title. The sections in limestones from northern Spain and the fault that you can pick out in this road section is listric. It reduces in dip as you go down through the outcrop. In the hanging wall, the beds roll over into the fault plane. But if we look elsewhere in the road section in here, we can see that the geometry of the rollover is rather complicated. And there's an array of subsidiary faults as the beds have attempted to deflect into the fault plane. So real rollover structures can have a whole pile of subsidiary faults that collectively accommodate the bending. It need not be the simple form that we saw in the idealized sketches at the start of this presentation. So that's a very brief look at listric normal faults. We've looked at the rollover anticlines, the fold structures created in the hanging wall to these shaped normal faults. We've seen that it's possible to use the fold geometry to predict the geometry of the underlying listric normal fault. We struck a note of caution in the interpretation of listric normal faults in seismic reflection profiles that are only displayed in two-way time. And finally, We've introduced the complexity that the rollover anticline may be accommodated by faulting rather than as a continuous fold structure.